mine yet, but I don't want to. I don't want to keep you waiting any longer, so you can fit it in. So, yeah. Okay, we're gonna go ahead, go ahead and get started. We're a few minutes behind. Um, <clears throat> just want to intro introduce uh, Jeremiah Grossman uh, to talk about uh, business logic attacks, uh, you know, web applications, and making money on the web. Um, for those of you who haven't uh, kind of read the the uh, the preview of, of the talk, uh, it's been pretty entertaining. I saw an earlier version of it. Uh, at OWASP, uh, I guess last fall, and uh, there's a lot of fun little stories in here, and uh, you can learn some some fun uh, web attacks along the way. So, uh, without further ado, Jeremiah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming and and uh, spending an hour with uh, with me here. Uh, this is probably a tougher talk time. Everybody's nice, well fed, a little lethargic. I'll uh, do my best. This uh, this talk has a very real possibility of changing your life forever. <laughs> No, seriously, I, I do my best. So uh, usually I'm known for uh, deep tech, deep web tech talks. Uh, you might have heard of things like, uh, might have heard of things like cross-site scripting, SQL injection. Forget it. We don't need it. We're gonna make a lot of money. We're gonna do it very simply. We're gonna have a lot of fun doing it. And if you have questions, ask at any time. Um, just a little bit about myself, so you know uh, uh, why it is. I, I might know a little bit of what, what I'm talking about. I've been doing web security stuff for about eight years now. Uh, back before web application security was a term, I used to work for Yahoo doing nothing but assessing Yahoo sites all day long. Uh, normally my days are spent in thirds. I spend a third of my time doing industry events like this, preaching the good word of web application security where I go, wherever I go. Uh, a third of my time uh, uh, with large enterprises or large and small enterprises, figuring out what their web security challenges are and how best I can help and sharing with them what I know. And a third of my time doing uh, uh, research and R&D and things like that. And in the meantime, I get to write books and get cool awards and things like that. Um, so a lot of the work uh, that we do at White Hat goes, is, like, is the background for this, uh, for this talk here. Unfortunately, probably 95% of the work that we do at White Hat, I can't talk about specifics of. It's really unfortunate because a lot of cool stuff that we do behind the scenes, lots of really, really righteous hacks that I can't ever talk about, ever. But the types of attacks that we encounter, there has been enough publicly disclosed in the wild now where we go, I can go, these are the attacks that we do see, not just the finding of vulnerabilities, the actual exploitation, what the bad guys are able to accomplish and uh, in, in our stuff. So there's been a lot of real world news stories out there. So in the background, just to give you some highlights of what we get to do for a living, we have probably closer to 200 enterprise customers and we assess their websites for a living. And we're probably assessing over a thousand now on a weekly basis. So it's a lot of websites, large and small, and we make a fair bit of press doing what we do because we get a really unique view of the security landscape out there as far as who's vulnerable to what and if they fix it at all. So I'm going to skip by a couple of these slides because um, it's not particularly irrelevant to this audience. Um, so when you look at website vulnerabilities, and we get the statistics from our, from our data set, we're assessing websites using technology and automated analysis. And most of the websites out there are vulnerable to something or another, something serious, and uh, not just our statistics, but everybody else is out there. So this is what's possible. You're potentially allowing attackers access to your site. But when you actually look at the different uh, reasons people are taking web security seriously is, well, the bad guys figured it out too, that they could hack websites and they can do so on a mass scale. So we know about 82% of the sites out there uh, from, our st uh, from our research have had vulnerabilities. 63% still do, since we're tracking the same sites all the time. And uh, breaches are finally occurring, and they're occurring in record numbers. I thought this was a pretty cool statistic from WebSense. The statistic is 70% of the top 100 most popular websites have either hosted malicious content or contained a mass redirect to lure unsuspecting victims from legitimate sites to malicious sites. So uh, bad guys figured it out, and bad guys are making us uh, pay for uh, 15 years of insecure web code. And there's only about 200 million websites out there, so don't worry. Everybody's got great job security and web security if you're interested. Um, the uh, FTC has recently gotten involved. I uh, got this uh, quote from a, an article, and uh, a very recent article, and they said over the last three years, the FTC has settled with 14 businesses over alleged inadequate data security practices, and this is al almost all of them. I would say 90% of them are directly from a web-based incident. So the FTC is having their fun. This is uh, White Hat's top 10. This is uh, our last statistics report, and if you're interested in the most recent copy, you can get one from our, uh, from our site. This is the way to read this is 67% of the sites that we look at have cross-site scripting, 45% have information leakage, and so on and so forth. Now, you're familiar with the ones called cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and 
uh, you know, some of the cross-site request for forgery, especially cross-site scripting and SQL injection. We can find those with a purely automated approach fairly reliably, and the bad guys uh, love using this stuff. And when they're exploited, they make a lot of noise. Um, the other ones that is kind of the, the, the hidden ones in the industry that vendors really don't like talking about because they can't automate the finding of. It usually just takes a rotating of a number to URL to jump into somebody else's account. But those are the ones with the arrows over it. And you don't see these talked about all that often in web security, but those are the ones we're going to particularly focus on because they're really easy to exploit and they make a lot of money when you do. So, uh, so if you can stay awake through the whole hour, we're going to go from zero dollar figure hacks all the way up into nine figures. And considering the current economy, I'll show you how to make nine figures using purely legal tactics. So your ethics might be better or worse than mine. We'll see. So why are business logic flaws important? Because that's the loose term we like to use in the industry. Uh, you know, what's the problem with them? Well, QA overlooks them. QA's job is to test what, a, what software should do, not what it can be made to do. Fundamentally different principle. Okay, they'll say, does this web, when you click on this button, does it transfer money? If, uh, if I go, well, I want to transfer money out of that guy's account into mine and make it do something other than that, they usually don't test for that stuff. Scanners can't identify them, and there's a very easy reason for this. They lack intelligence and don't know if something worked or not. They, they lack context. A lot of times they can't tell if they're logged in or not. If they rotate a number to URL and they jump into somebody else, else's account, it's just data to the scanner, and they have lack uh, contextual knowledge. And this is a really difficult problem to solve. You run into the Turing problem all the time in our, in our space. Uh, web application firewalls and IDSs can't defend them, at least not reliably. At least I wouldn't protect my website with them on these particular issues. I might for other ones, but not business logic flaws. Because the, the, many of the attacks that we're going to throw at these websites, and I'll, they're very easy to do, will look like pure, there'll be purely normal website traffic. There will be no shell meta characters or anything like that. Just real traffic that'll look like every other traffic, every other piece of traffic on the site. And uh, business logic flaws equal a whole lot of money. So we, uh, you know, we've spent the last three to five years looking at cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and you know, three to five years, those might be on their way out if we're lucky. Maybe not CSRF, but business logic flaws will persist because, you know, they're really difficult to root out. So we're going to start from very low dollar figures and end up with the seven-figure hacks out there. And uh, so we'll start very simply because business logic flaws comes in all shapes and sizes. And uh, we'll start with the very, the very, very simple one, online polls. So everybody here has probably at least seen, if not filled out, an online poll of some kind. They might be uh, political. They might be just personal interests on some blog. But there's no niche too narrow or too wide so you can have an online poll. And online polls do have a way of swaying public opinion on different things like that. And uh, so this one particular online poll um, was a, an Austin, uh, an Austin, I'm sorry, the way it's described, there's the Westminster Dog Show, for those that are familiar with it. Well, there was a, uh, uh, an Austin dog that won the contest. So they, this particular newspaper uh, set up a online poll system where people can upload their favorite Austin dog, and you can vote on all the dogs in Austin. So this is the way they did it. And whoever would win, they wouldn't win praise or anything like that. They would get their name in the newspaper, and they would get bragging rights. So, you know, no, that's no, nothing other than that. So all you did when you go to the website is you would upload your dog's picture, and you get to vote yes or no. Very simple process. And the way the contest was tallied, it was not about, uh, you know, total votes, but instead about percentages. So it was a ratio between yes votes, this is my favorite dog, or I like this dog, or no, it wasn't. So in this particular system, there was three ways to cheat. And the first way was to uh, place a lot of positive votes in the dog that you like. You know, just click yes, 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 over and over and over again, because they didn't have any security mechanisms to prevent that. So that was one way, just the standard ballot stuffing. You can do ballot stuffing in the opposite direction, where you can cast negative votes towards your competitors and overwhelm them that way. Or the third one, um, which was kind of interesting, was during the last minutes, if you could time when the, when the results or the contest was going to end, you can put in your dog at the last minute, press yes one time, you have a perfect ratio of one yes to zero no's, and you win the contest. So uh, a good friend of mine, you might know him, uh, Robert Arsnake Hansen, who's here, heard of Arsnake, right? So he's from Austin, and uh, so Austin, being the super hacker that he is, um, he, his girlfriend's coworker, <laughs> and this is the plight of the web hacker, right? Um, so his girlfriend's coworker asked him to help her dog Tiny win the contest. So, uh, so he uh, begrudgingly consents, he, and so uh, he goes forth, and he fires up, uh, you know, Burt Proxy, his favorite hacking tool, 
and uh, he just takes the path of the least resistance. He submits 2,000 votes. To, uh, he uploads Tiny's picture, submits 2,000 votes, uses Burp, rotates it through, and uh, boosts Tiny into first place. So, logs off. He's good to go. <laughs> he's gonna, you know, uh, you know, show his girlfriend how big a man he is, and uh, win an Austin dog contest, a polling contest for the local newspaper. And uh, so the the contest ends. So he, you know, Tiny's boosted into first. And uh, so what happens is the contest ends, and this dog comes out of nowhere, Choo Choo comes out of nowhere and uh, totally pones Tiny with technique number two. <laughs> so apparently that dog's owner cast a bunch of negative votes, uh, you know, towards Tiny and, you know, using technique number two and cause our snake to lose. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure his girlfriend was none, his fiance was none too pleased with this uh, particular uh, Particular issue, but it kind of shows where web security has gotten to, where you, where uh, one of the better web hackers in the world can't easily win a online polling contest in the city of Austin for Chihuahuas. So, <laughs> so you know, just kind of shows where you know web security can start very simply, and people are actually looking for these things for you know just bragging rights. All right, enough with online polling. Let's move on to captures. All right. Uh, Everybody's seen these by now. <laughs> uh, probably seen them, hates them. I do too. Um, but these are CAPTCHAs. Uh, it's a system to tell the difference between humans and automated robots that are designed to spam the hell out of our systems. And uh, so, <coughs> loosely, what they look like. And the reason that bad guys want to defeat these things, I'm sure you guys know this stuff, is bad guys want to defeat these CAPTCHA systems so they can spam us. So they can spam us with webmail, spam us with social networking things, register accounts, and all sorts of, and all sorts of things. And uh, CAPTCHA technology, I think the, uh, the first time it was used was uh, back when I was at Yahoo in early 2000 with, in conjunction with Carnegie Mellon. And, but they're ubiquitous out there. You find these in blog comments and things like that. And we, have, we need these things to be strong, otherwise we get inundated. Uh, and there's, Three different ways that captures can be defeated, and I'll walk through simply the uh, the, the three high-level methods. There's a flawed implementation, and there's all different flaws in these things. Let's say the the entropy in the answer is not that large, where you can kind of guess the answer, or if you answer it one time with a human the first time, you can reuse the same answer over and over again. So I created a captcha effect in this test that you can kind of measure the effectiveness of a captcha. But there are flawed implementations out there, and some of the, the the implementations on the larger websites are pretty good. But once you get down from that, usually you can game them pretty easily. Um, OCR, uh, a, an attack that has been popular for a while, getting more effective. Now it seems like the bots are, be are better at reading at CAPTCHAs than humans are. So I don't know if that makes them more human than we are at this point. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of research papers in these areas on how to get you know, optical character recognition to read these images. And uh, with enough success rate to make the, automated, uh, the most automated uh, processes possible. And they work just fine on a lot of the major systems. I don't know if there's any capture out there on the major system that uh, can't be broken reliably at this point. So that's number two. Number three is my personal favorite. This is the Mechanical Turk, or you know, I think uh, what did Hoff call it? The the meat cloud, right? Uh, so what you do is, since there's a let's there's a lot of sought after content on there. There might be MP3s. There might be adult entertainment online games and things like that. So what you want to do is you want to proxy the CAPTCHA. So what you do is you create one of these popular websites, a adult entertainment website, game website, free music, free wares. You set up this website, user comes to the website and says, I want this stuff. You go, okay, no problem, I'll give it to you for free, provided you, you fill out this CAPTCHA. And the CAPTCHA will come from the target website. Let's say you're trying to sign up with a whole bunch of Yahoo Mail accounts. You go to the Yahoo Mail account, you grab the CAPTCHA, deliver it to your user, they fill it out, and they proxy the service back in. So you, as long as you have enough visitors coming to your website with sought after free content, then you can uh, automate this process using the meat cloud. So no one has a really good solution for this particular method, and it's highly effective. So uh, Robert Hansen, again, our snake, decided to do some research in this area to see uh, you know, if there's groups of people out there that their mission in life, their companies are designed are set up such that they have rooms of people filling out captures all day long. So he talked to a Romanian company, and uh, the Romanian uh, the email came back and it said there's three to five hundred captures per person per hour. The client pays between nine and fifteen dollars per thousand captures solved. So it kind of gives you an idea of the business the economics. Um, the team works around twelve hours a day. Imagine having that job. I think your jobs are bad. Um, that means that they can solve somewhere around 4,800 captures per day per person, and depending on how, how hard the captures are, you can, uh, uh, you can run, that can run you around $50 per day per person. That's his estimate. 
All right. So he posts this blog post up there, and uh, all of a sudden, a bunch of other uh, companies, I guess, show up. And one says, uh, hello, I from Vietnam. We group with 20 persons. We, we work some site, Rabat, Ruble, look. Our rate, $4 per thousand captures salt. So that was kind of interesting. More piled on, says, hi, hope you're doing well. We the leading data processing company in Bangladesh. Presently, we are processing 100,000 captures per day by our 30 operators. <laughs> Uh, some kind of weird call center. Um, we, ha we have a well set up, and we can give you the law rate uh, for the CAPTCHA solving. Apparently, their uh, CAPTCHA solving is better than their English. Um, Two dollars per thousand CAPTCHAs. That's interesting. And then there's somebody else emailed, uh, commented after. I'm just we're interested in data entry work. I don't know where this came from. So, sign of the times, I guess. Um, so. Uh, then I like this particular quote uh, from ZDNet, the Zero Day blog. It says, no CAPTCHA can survive a human that's receiving financial incentives for solving it and with an army of low-wage India CAPTCHA breakers. So, actually, I'll just ask the audience real quick. Is CAPTCHA breaking in this method, is this legal? <laughs> probably, probably is, sure. Um, for my sake, who cares? You're only making a few dollars an hour. I would like to make more. <laughs> so, let's move on. Uh, recovering someone else's password. It's a feature. <laughs> um, everybody forgets their password from time to time, even those of us in this room. And unless you want your, your uh, customers filling up your, your customer call support, you're going to offer a way to reset their passwords using a variety of, of mechanisms. There's all sorts of ways to do this stuff. So how do you recover somebody else's password? So this is uh, something that actually happened out there. This was a, a case study that, was, that came to light on Sprint. How to, hack, uh, how to hijack a Sprint user's account with just a cell phone number. That's all you needed, Sprint cell phone number, because they had a password recovery uh, flow on their site. These issues are entirely common. If you know what you're looking for, you go to these sites, you look how their forgot password rec uh, recovery flow works, and if you just use some common sense, you can break into these things. So in this particular case, if you had the person's cell phone number, you could change their, you can break into their account, change their billing address, order cell phones, uh, to a drop location and leave the victim paying the bills. Um, you could also, if you really, really wanted to be evil, you could add GPS tracking to their cell phones and watch them, you know, move around the place. All right. So um, this particular case, they had the uh, the infamous secret question methodology. You know, things that you can never, ever, ever guess. And I know it's a little hard to read, so I'll have to quote it here. The uh, it has you had to get three questions right with, that are three multiple choice questions. And in this case is. Uh, which of the following vehicle makes has been registered at the following address? And it gives you five options. And the first one is a Lotus, followed by Honda, Lamborghini, Fiat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I used my, 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 my glorious deductive capabilities and I chose Honda. Um, the second question was, which one of the following uh, people have uh, resided with you or used the same address as you? So. If you know anything at all about the person that you have a cell phone number for, you might be able to just guess these particular things reliably. I mean, there's only five, right? How hard could it be? But in this particular case, if you see the, uh, the top one there, it has these little eyes at the end there. It says uh, uh, Jerry Steft, and that's supposed to be the third, as it, it copied itself out of the database, and normally it's supposed to be pipe, 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 you know, I, I, I. It, the capitalization got a little weird when I was copying over to the database, so you know that one's the right one because it's sort of anomalous. And uh, the third one here, in, in which of the following cities have you ever, have you never lived or used in your address? So again, if you know anything about the person, you might be able to guess these, but there's actually another way. If you look at the, addre if the, the cities, it says Longmont, North Hollywood, Genoa, and Butte. Now, if you just did a Google map search, you'll find that Three of those cities there are all in the same region except for North Hollywood. <laughs> That's the anomaly. So you can just choose that one and you break into the accounts and you just reset their password and off you go. You jump in and you land into an interface that looks similar to this and you can do whatever you want with the person's accounts. So forgot password flows and you know you find them still over the place. Like, you know what's the person's favorite color and you know statistically speaking it'll be blue. <laughs> so you have all different methods. So. These systems are really, really weak, and you can try to keep on stacking, uh, you know, the secret questions over and over again. But they get annoying, and people don't want to answer who their kindergarten teacher was or anything like that. So people have uh, now, well, I shouldn't say people, website owners have now moved over to uh, resetting your password via email. 
right? All over the place. Everybody uses these things. PayPal, Google, MySpace, Netflix, everybody. And uh, so a couple of things happen here. Uh, one is, it, for, if you're looking to hijack somebody's account, why go after the intended target? If you're trying to hack somebody's web bank, why? Don't hack their web bank, go hack their email. It's not like it's designed to be secure. It's a web mail, right? It's free. How much security resources are they investing in it? Because you don't care so much about your email. You're caring, what, you're caring about what access that email grants you. So you go after their email address. So how pervasive is this web mail stuff? It's actually pretty wide. Um, these numbers are a little old now, but they're good enough for our purposes here. If you look at Yahoo Mail, there's 262 million people on, on Yahoo Mail, another 250 million on Hotmail, probably closer to 100 million on Gmail, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of people use this web mail stuff, and they tie it back to their web bank, Netflix, PayPal. How many people here are offenders of this kind of thing, where you're tying really, really important accounts to web mail accounts, and you're sharing it with every admin that works at those companies? Don't think they don't read it, they do. I don't care what their privacy policies say. <laughs> Nobody wants to admit it. It's okay. It's all right. So, in case you don't have uh, great skills at hacking uh, webmail providers, okay, this is get rich or die trying. I promise, non-technical stuff. There are places that will offer to do the services for you for a fee. They call their some. They call themselves password recovery services. Just in case you lost your password and you know you don't have an email to tie it back to. So, uh, for for forty-three dollars, roughly converted, you can uh, break an overseas mailbox. You can, for $29, you can break a domestic mailbox password. For $143, you can break a company's mailbox password. So there are services that you can buy that will do this for you. And they might use brute force methods. They might know of a vulnerability in the service. You really don't know, nor do you care. You just care that they bring back the, the goods. So they have services out there for 163, 122, QQ, Yahoo, and so on and so forth. You can spend just a little bit of money and break into anybody's account you really, really want with, within reason. Uh, another service out there, I'm not too sure about the legitimacy of this one. Um, I've, I've, I've had friends that have put down the 150 just to see and uh, I haven't heard the results back yet, but this is hired to hack. They claim that they can crack all Yahoo, MSN, Hotmail, AOL, and Gmail passwords in less than 24 hours. Tell us if someone cracks faster and we give you candy. They, uh, you know, they have variable project-based pricing starting at about $150 USD, and they accept a Western Union. Good service out there. So it kind of, it's kind of interesting. So the bad guys, so there's a certain type of hacker out there that really doesn't know what to do with the data if they got it, so if they broke into your Yahoo Mail account, they don't want to extract money from your bank account. They have a very particular skill set. They know how to break into the email account, and they want to partner up with other bad guys that know how to extract value out of a bank account. So that's how they segregate, segregate themselves here. So passwords are valuable, but so are usernames, uh, especially if you're really able to validate them as an email address on the system in question. So uh, Fisher's like using uh, you know, use the, use the login and password recovery screens uh, to mine for valid email addresses using timing-based attacks. If you're running a social network, you're probably measuring these on your systems now. Um, a lot of the social networks out there, probably everybody in this room now, you know, contrary to all the, you know, the, the talks you're, li you're likely to see, has a, you have a social networking account, and then your username is your email address. So what you do is, um, well, I'm not sorry, what you do is, uh, a lot of times if, if a person's email address is disclosed on these systems through some mechanism, it's a high severity issue that they, uh, they consider a high severity issue. So the way the timing attacks work is, is that let's say you put in your username and your email address onto the system. You put in your username and it goes to the first if statement. The first if statement is, does this email address exist on the system, yes, no. If it does, it moves on to the next phase, which is, does the password match the hash or whatever it is? And that's the next phase. However, if the username doesn't exist on the system, it never gets to the second if, and hence a timing delay. And a lot of times you can measure these timing delays on these social networking sites. You just brute force guess a bunch of uh, email addresses. You can actually see which ones are on the system. You just got to notice the, the shift just a little bit, and it is noticeable enough to actually extract email addresses out. So good for fishers, bad for us. Any questions so far? I want to get to the real cash, so we're just moving a little quickly. So we got, uh, let's see, you know, uh, three-figure hacks. So let's move on to uh, five-figure hacks, uh, monetizing e-coupons. E uh, e-coupons, discount codes, whatever you choose to call them, um, you place an order, you put a little code in, you get a discount, dollar, fig uh, dollar amount off, everything's, everything's uh, good. So uh, I can't, unfortunately, I can't give you the name of this one because it hasn't uh, been revealed, but I thought it was cool enough to add anyway. 
So, uh, the, so a large online retailer had a brand new e-portal out there and uh, just getting up and running on the site and they had a really a lot of high dollar figure items on there. So they partnered with an Amex, uh, with Amex and uh, I think it was another intermediary to, to validate these things. And so the coupons, the coupon gifts were actually uh, uh, Amex one time 16 digit credit card numbers in a, in, a, in a manner of speaking that anywhere from a few dollars to you know a few hundred dollars whatever the case may be and the numbers weren't exactly sequential but they were verifiable you know how credit card numbers normally work so you, you can just brute force or guess a lot of these now they had some security in place in the system when it was originally deployed the first one was initially only three coupons were allowed to be applied on a single order that was until the business saw people putting huge orders in there, right? Because the site got really popular. So they wanted to put huge orders on there, but people wanted to add more than three coupons. So, uh, so the business just decided without really thinking about it, well, let's just drop the three coupon limit and go on from there. So someone developed a script that tried thousands of possible valid coupon I coupons IDs every single hour, just brooding the hell out of the system. And what they found later in their investigation was that orders that were worth over 50 grand were bought for mere dollars, where 200 or more indiv individual coupons were applied. Maybe, maybe not illegal. Who, who knows? Now, how did they fi find this out? How did they find out what was going on? Anybody have a, a wild guess? How did they figure it out? Logs? Could be. I guess it's uh, somebody tried to use a coupon that had already been used by, by, uh, by someone else. Could be. I, had, I actually had bo both those two guesses, and they were both wrong, actually. <laughs> um, the, the someone told them about it? What's that? Someone told them about it? No, actually. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll give it away. So the problem went unnoticed because uh, during a system capacity planning exercise, the system was 90% uh, was plus utilization during off-peak hours where the guy was brute forcing the system. <laughs> so uh, when people caught up with because their coupon code was invalid, they just gave them another one. They didn't really ask why. <laughs> So, uh, so the, the peak was going, so they go, and then they, then they looked at the logs, not you know, the other way around. Then they looked at the logs and went, oh, then they figured out the hack. Um, the FBI investigated, and there was a couple interesting things. That the, uh, the first one was that the products were sent to a non-existent uh, address, but never came back. According to the investigation, it said that the person had colluded with a mail carrier who intercepted the merchandise. And, they <laughs> so, uh, and the last interesting thing about this particular hack was that coupons are not currency, only a tool for marketing. So instead of uh, being investigated by, in, so instead they were investigated by the Secret Service and face counts of mail fraud, which is probably way worse than a cyber crime. <laughs> so uh, any, any question about that one? All right. So who's here seeing Office Space? Everybody, every, come on. If you haven't seen Office Space, go run it like now. <laughs> What's, oh, you're lying. <laughs> so, uh, so this is actually a real-life office space hack, the, the closest thing I've seen in recent memory of the office space hack, you know, the, the few pennies at a time. For those of you who have brokerage accounts, you'll know what these little, mi or a PayPal account, you'll know what these micro, micro deposit things are, but let's say you want to tie a brokerage account to your bank account. The brokerage account will fire a couple of micropayments to your bank account, and you'll go and verify the amounts of the micropayments back at the, at, uh, at, the broker, at the brokerage or PayPal or whatever to see if everything worked fine. So, uh, you know, the micropayments, they might come in one deposit, two deposits, and a few cents to maybe a buck, but probably not. So uh, this particular gentleman, Michael Largent, 22 years old, Plumas Lake, California, um, you know, my home state, um, he opens 5,800 brokerage accounts using fake names, addresses, and social security numbers for the brokerage accounts. Uh, Largent allegedly favored cartoon characters for the names, including Johnny Blaze, King of the Hill Patriarch Hank Hill, and Rusty Shackelford. <laughs> um, so he signs up with a bunch of these brokerage accounts and starts funneling the money pennies at a time into these bank accounts here. Uh, Capital One, Bank Corp, uh, Meta, Bank Corp, uh, Metabank, uh, Green Dot, Skylight, and so on and so forth. Now, um, he starts doing this stuff, and he starts racking up a whole lot of cash. Um, he starts targeting Google. He makes eight grand off of Google. He makes another 50 off of E-Trade and Schwab. And he profits using a prepaid debit cards. Now, uh, what's illegal about this one? What, what did he do that was so terribly wrong? I'm, I'm sorry? So apparently he fates uh, not only multiple computer accounts of, uh, of 
computer fraud, wire fraud, and mail fraud, but he was snared by the U.S. Patriot Act. <laughs> Fake names, don't do it. <laughs> so uh, that's how. So that's probably not a good call to get when you're, uh, you know. <laughs> so I, th I think he pled guilty. I forget what the repercussions were, but I thought it was an, in an interesting hack. I guess if he kept signing up his own name or something like that, or the same social security number, he might have got away with it. But who knows? Um, all right, let's move up to higher dollar figures. One thing you'll notice about these particular hacks is that the higher the dollar figures get, the lower the sophistication. <laughs> Strange how it works. Now, people buy things online, or you buy things any place, and sometimes people get buyer's remorse. They don't want what they ordered, order the wrong thing. You know, your spouse didn't like that particular one or whatever. So you want to cancel the order before it gets shipped out to you so you don't have to ship it back. So people order things all the time, and there's a certain amount of uh, a churn rate. So when you order something, you have to have a facility to, for, to allow the user to cancel the order and for that to go back to the order fulfillment center and cancel and stop the order. So, uh, and so people do that all the time. Uh, one person by the name of Quantina Moore Perry, 33 years old, of Greensboro, North Carolina, she tries this. She orders an item on, uh, you know, on uh, um, QVC, and I'll get to that in a moment. She orders something on QVC, puts in the item, hits cancel, she doesn't want it anymore, and the item comes anyway. She thought that was pretty interesting. So she decides to uh, do it again, and she did it, does it 1,800 times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she orders handbags, housewares, jewelry, all a bunch of stuff, right? And, you know, the items were shipped anyway. So what do you do with all this merchandise? You sell it on eBay. <laughs> Anybody want to take a wild guess at how much cash you made? <laughs> now, so he, so here, here's the interesting one here. So that's nearly a half a million dollars by pressing ordering and hitting the cancel button. <laughs> okay. Now, how does this person get caught? What? I'm sorry. Could have been. That's actually pretty close, actually. So apparently the QVC uh, uh, became aware of the problem because somebody on eBay who bought the item noticed it was still in QVC packaging. <laughs> 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 so, uh, you know, she pled guilty to in, in federal court to wire fraud. But the, uh, the interesting thing that's happened as I was digging into the research here, you know, what, you know, if she had repackaged it, you know, and put a better, you know, stamp on it, would it have been okay? So I went to the FTC website and found this, uh, this interesting thing on their frequently asked questions. It says, question, am I obligated to return or pay for merchandise or never ordered? They say, no, if you receive merchandise that you didn't order, you have the legal right to keep it as a free gift. <laughs> it's questionable, so. I'm not a lawyer, but. <laughs> I don't want to test it, <laughs> but <laughs> what if? How long did she get? Uh, I, I actually don't know. I'm. I'm. I'm it was a plea deal. She probably fined a whole lot. Probably didn't have to do any jail time or whatever. I don't know for sure. I, I have the the reference in there if we want to look it up, but. I, <laughs> Apparently so. I mean, maybe she would have stopped at 200 grand. She would have been cool. What we also don't, what she also don't know is how many other people did the exact same thing and perhaps didn't get caught, or on not only QVC but other sites as well. People could be doing this today. I really have no idea. Nor will we ever know. How do you tie back this to what they actually did? You know. <laughs> Anybody questioning their ethics yet? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. This so. Uh, one of the things that you get as a as a web hacker, if you you know travel on planes and stuff, people you know ask you what you do, and if you tell them what you do for a living, you know, I'm a web security guy. He goes, oh, you can hack banks. Yeah, I can hack banks. Um, anybody ever get this question? <laughs> Every now and then, yeah, I, I'm, I, I graduate. I used to get asked all the time if I can hack uh, Yahoo Mail accounts and then MySpace accounts, and I really hate those. So. Uh, a great target if you want to hack a bank is not a bank directly. Why would you hack a really, really large bank when you can hack the ASP of a mid-tier banking organization? These are much better targets because they're weaker targets. And the reason they're weaker targets is because they already have the bank's money and they have no incentive after that point to actually invest more in security. So when you break into an application service provider for a financial institution, it's not just one bank, you have hundreds. 
and no one's really watching the logs. Okay. So you have these really, really uh, interesting ASV system, ASP systems, and this is a case study of one that we did run into. We run into these all the time. And uh, so this is the system in, in question. That's the URL up there, and if you can read it for yourself, you can probably figure out how the system is designed. Um, so the, everything is built off this app.cgi. Every customer, every client of the ASP is given a unique client ID. They get one for them. Each financial application they have on that ASP gets a unique bank ID. So if you have you know, your, your savings, uh, savings accounts, you have one for that one, one. Your savings systems, you have that one, another, you know, corporate credit or whatever, you have another one. And each account, bank account on that system or financial account has a, its own unique ID. So our job, so our customer in this case was the, was the banking customer, not the ASP. Normally, unless it's a really particular case, ASPs do not like talking to us. We give them bad news. <laughs> okay, so our customer is the bank, so our, all our results are funneled through them, so our job is to pen test these things, uh, assess or whatever you call it. So we decided, you know, we, you know, we're reasonably smart, you know, web hacker type guys, and we said, what's the first thing we ought to do? And we said, okay, we'll take a look at that account ID and we'll rotate it down. Cool, total the number, going like super hackers. And uh, so we changed the account ID and we got this big red error message on the screen that says, wait a minute. Account X belongs to Bank Y. Okay, cool. <laughs> and uh, so we okay, it's helping us. It's, it's, cool, it's cool. So we take the Bank Y number, we plug it into the Bank ID Y number, we hit enter on the browser. You know, the browser is like the best web hacking tool there is, right? You, you know, if you're a hacker, usually, you know, web hackers, they don't really use vulnerability scanners normally because it's much faster just to use your browser. So, because, you know, bad guy just needs one vulnerability, they don't need all of them. So, so we, we enter the bank, the bank Y number in there, hit enter again, and we get the same error message again, just a little bit different. It goes, wait a minute, bank Y belongs to client Z. Okay, no problem, cool. We'll take client Z number, we'll plug it in there, hit enter again, we changed it, and then we could drop into anybody's bank account, anybody's account on any bank, on any client, on the entire system. The actual, the system itself actually had no notion of authorization at all. As long as you were logged in, it was cool, you can do whatever you want because no one would could possibly guess the URL numbers. So, you know, we, we put our results together and, you know, shipped it over to our customer who then re related to the ASP. Let's see here. So no notion of authorization, I got that. And so we said, you know, you should really fix this thing. You really want to, like, have if statements for authorization in there. And since the system really wasn't designed for authorization, we figured it was going to take them a f at least a few weeks to fix this particular issue. And uh, so, you know, they set out and went forth. And they got back to us within two days and said they had fixed the issue. We're like, wow, man, these guys must like stellar programmers. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that went back up the chain to us, and they said, uh, the, our banking customer said, you know, you should go retest this stuff. And we said, okay. And so we go back into the system, we do the same process, and, you know, there's no error messages in the system. We hit enter, and no error messages come up. But our old URL still worked across accounts. So, you know, we used a great hacking technique called ViewSource. Apparently, they just uh, commented out the error messages in the HTML of the page. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me tell you, that was a really interesting uh, conference call. And at the end of that particular conference call, they said the back end business controls would prevent these issues. Like, okay. <laughs> Uh, who are we to disagree? They, they said they had back-end controls that prevent you from wiring money out of somebody else's account into your account. So we said, okay. So we start testing these particular issues, and uh, we start wiring money between our accounts, and we get this check in the mail. That's made out to WH test in the amount of $2. You know, so yeah, we're making a lot of money. But it showed that it worked. Uh, and so that was, you know, a couple of, a couple of weeks later, we got those checks, and a, a couple of months later, the issue went unfixed. Okay, it's a long fix, and the ESP really doesn't want to fix this stuff, so no issue. Okay, but a couple of months later, we got word back from our from our customer that said uh, one of their customers' accounts was hacked uh, via this mechanism. Uh, Seventy thousand dollars was illegally wired to an Eastern European country. The money was not recoverable because of the time that it took to find out. Uh, the ASP definitely lost a customer. Um, the number of un 
of other customers affected was unknown. It was not disclosed publicly. And there it went. That's it. You change the number of the URL and you make 70 grand. How many here can think they can manage that particular process? Don't think it's any more secure today. <laughs> All right. So we're at five figures. Well, high five figures. Let's move on to uh, bigger ones. Let's move on to, to six. Um, affiliate scams. Uh, so you have online merchants. Well, you have affiliate networks. And let, let me explain affiliate network and the players behind it. So you have merchants. Merchants run websites, have products to sell, and they pay commissions to affiliates, those who drive traffic to them. If the user clicks a link, the affiliate gets a commission. If the, if the customer buys something, affiliate gets a commission. All just, de all just depends. Affiliates are the ones that control a whole lot of traffic and push the people through the system and they get paid on cost per click, cost per acquisition, a whole bunch of other crazy uh, acronyms. The customer is the person who buys stuff and the affiliate network is the glue that binds it all together and creates a network. So that's the players when you talk about the affiliate revenue industry. Okay? That's the network. And there's a lot of dollars flowing between these particular systems. If you don't believe me, ask Google because that's their entire business model. So, so you have uh, affiliate networks on Google, eBay, Amazon, every major website, Commission Junction, you name it. Now, a lot of money to be made in this system if you know how to game it. Before we show you how to game it, I'll show you how it's supposed to work. All right. So, first thing you do if you want your affiliate, you demand a lot of traffic, you run a really popular blog. Uh, you uh, sign up with an affiliate network and you get a special link, and the special link looks something like that. You get a link that goes to back to the affiliate network and you get an affiliate ID, like 100 or something like that, depending on who you are. The way this works is, should a user click on this link, they go navigate to the affiliate network, they get redirected to the endpoint, but that user gets cookied with an affiliate ID of, uh, looks something like that, the user gets cookie with affiliate ID with your ID in it. So in the event that they click or buy something, uh, you get paid, and that's how they track the system. So if the customer buys something within the next period of time and the affiliate cookie is still, still exists, you get a little bit of revenue. Okay, that's how the system is supposed to work. Now, if you use really, really effective search engine optimization tactics, and all this SEO guys are using web hacker tricks with cross-site scripting and stuff to spread their links out there and bots and all kinds of stuff. Want to know why uh, you know, captures want to be broken? It's this method here. So if you're able to drive a whole lot of traffic legally or illicitly, you can make a lot of money. So I'm not going to test that this particular guy um, cheated the system. But this is how much money there is to be made. Okay, This is a, a Google check. And I'm sorry, it's a little small. Let me blow this up for you here. That's a Google check for a 132, almost $133,000, and they pay on a monthly basis normally. Is that enough money? Okay, maybe it's not for me actually. <laughs> this guy here, this one. Okay, let me blow this up here. That's 901,000. Now, everybody, everybody got real quiet. See, they're on my like, missed the marker. Everybody's like, hmm. <laughs> now, in all fairness, this is for this. I'm, I'm sorry. What was? It? <laughs> so, in all fairness, this particular check here was for two months because the first the bank bounced the first one because it was too large. <laughs> now, how do we make these dollar figures here using cookie stuff, uh, using a, a particular method? This is method has been used since '99. Okay, a lot of money here. So, how do you game these particular systems? Okay, this is a term called cookie stuffing. Some of you might have heard of it. It takes one line of code to pull off. So. There's nothing in the world that says to cookie a user with your affiliate ID that they have to click a link. All they have to do is generate a web request that you told them to generate. You don't have to click. All you have to do is when they visit a page that you control or you control some code on, that's normally you put it in a little ahref and they click it, but you can use an image tag as well. And that auto generates the click and they get cookied automatically. You can use an iframe too. Want to know why all those, uh, all those iframes are around? That's one method. If you ever looked at your browser, after you've been to an infected page, you're going to be loaded up with about a thousand of these little affiliate codes, right? Because on the off chance that you buy something in Amazon, they're getting commissioned. Real quiet again. <laughs> so imagine you can place these one little liners in comments on blogs, uh, social networking profiles. You can spam users in webmail. Any place with HTML, you just put this little piece of code in there, and that's it. Yes, sir? But they weren't blocking it until recently, relatively. 
So about 2005, these SEO sites here and many, many like them were trading these tricks around and the affiliate networks and the merchants were figuring, figuring onto this. So about 2005 is when they finally caught onto it. Okay. And uh, so they got wise to cookie stuffing and they started tracking the refers. Because if your site is supposed to be, you know, let's say Jeremiah Grossman's blog, and all of a sudden my affiliate network, my affiliate traffic is coming from MySpace, that's a dead giveaway that something, something funky has happened, they go investigate. So, cookie stuffing circa 2007, okay? Web hackers won't be denied. <laughs> so, what do they do next? The affiliates start posting their code on SSL web pages. Why do they do this? Because according to RFC spec, if you're on an SSL web page redirecting traffic to an, another an off-site SSL page, it will not send the refer because that is a security violation. Untrackable. <laughs> so all the requ requests that are sent to the affiliate networks are devoid of a refer. And if you don't want to use the SSL method, there's other ways to, to mask it in IE. You can use JavaScript and strange tricks with the meta refresh and get it to suppress the, uh, the refer all the same. Yes, sir. Got no idea, no one really wants to find out because all the incentives are misaligned. The affiliate networks certainly aren't gonna report it. Merchants have no way of tracking it and the bad guys certainly aren't gonna tell anybody. No, one is in, no one's really investigating. There have been a few, uh, a few court cases around this stuff but no one really knows how big this particular fraud actually is. <laughs> so, take it for what it's worth. Was there any other questions on this one? The, the, issue, the issue is not the, the validity of the cookie, it's that you're forcing a user to send a request they didn't intend to make or didn't know they made. Cause so it's, it came from the user. That's the problem. It came from the user, from their browser. That's what's so damaging about cross-site request forgery in general, because it was you, you were sitting at the computer, you were logged in, blah, 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 but it's, it was you. That's, you know, that's what makes it difficult. So if you can come to my blog or some, you know, anybody's rogue page and they can make you download illegal content, pick your type, you did. If there's no Trojan defense, you did. So kind of scary there. So this is just the money making version. Tell us if this has now been resolved. No, it actually got worse. People making millions of dollars right now off of this. I cannot verify. I can only tell you what I see here. I would guess, yeah. I have insider knowledge, which I can't share, but, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but to think about it here, the affiliate networks, they're not gonna investigate. Why would they? <laughs> How can the merchant investigate? They don't know. It's just the price, is just got, the price that they're paying for the traffic is just gonna naturally adjust compared mm -hmm. to make parity, but there is loss. So, so are you saying if they cut a check for a million dollars to somebody one month, they just say, great? Yeah. They don't look and see who this person is, or? How much is their check? Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. It's probably bigger. <laughs> If it's a fraudulent click, if they don't pay out to the uh, affiliate, they don't get paid either. <laughs> so that's the problem. <laughs> yes, sir. Can you tell us what the largest amount you know of is? Uh, at least seven figures. But I, again, I can't, I'm please don't believe, I, I, can't, I can't give you no, a resource. I, I said if you can tell us. Yeah. It, uh, Got no idea, no one's been prosecuted. <laughs>
there have been cases of, of, uh, of fraud where they'll kick you off the network and then you get to re-sign up again, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, for those that follow uh, web security work, Nate McFedders, they have the DNS rebinding stuff. So makes this stuff way, way worse. Same stuff. Generate requests with all the legit data and there's no way to track it back. So that'll be like when, when they break the SSL stuff and they move on to the next phase, the bad guys are already one step ahead. They just, you know. All right, let's move into nine figures. So we'll make, we'll make money another way. So uh, stock market's a little shaky these days, but you can make money on the way up as you can on the way down. So how do you make money on trading on semi-public semi information? How do you get semi-public information? So this is, again, real-world case study. This happens. Can cite it, and it happens many more times. I just can't tell you which ones they are. So uh, Business Wire, for those that are not familiar with Business Wire, they have two types of subscribers. One is the companies that are issuing press releases and the subscribers that consume said press releases. So when you put a press release on Business Wire, they give you a nice uh, predictable URL there. Under press releases, it's dated and it's ID'd. And if you want to put an embargo date on there, say, don't link into the website until this date, you can. So Business Wire, in this case, had these predictable URLs here. And if you just asked for those, so they don't get linked in and broadcasted out to the site until the embargo date is hit. Does not mean that the file is not there, though. So just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And the only security business wire had on this particular thing, we call this predictable resource location, was that you had to be logged into business wire. There was no authorization check whether or not you could actually get the file at that particular time. So bad guys figured this out. The, in this case, the bad, bad guys were an Estonian financial firm. They discovered the press releases were named by these URLs in a predictable fashion, started crawling through the site, grabbed these press releases, and uh, you know, started, started trading. And before the SEC found out, they had profited right around $8 million on the information that they had gleaned. So the question is, is this illegal? It's, it, it's, it's on the system. So, so we, let's, let's just leave it. We don't know for sure. I don't want to get that call from the SEC, so that's not, probably not a very good thing. So, however, there's a related case that I'll describe for you now that gives a light, that sheds light on this. It's not web related, but in this particular case, there was a Ukrainian hacker. He breaks into a company called Thompson Financial, steals a, a gloomy announcement, uh, an earnings report on a company called IMS Health just hours before it's set to release in the market. He's betting the stock would go down, puts in $42,000 converted of sell orders, and for a Ukrainian person, that's a sizable amount of money, so you gotta know that they were sure of what they had. This person hacked in, okay? Cyber crime, you know, hacked in. There was no like weird web, esoteric web hack. No, they hacked in. The stock falls, nets 300 grand, the, uh, the broker raises some red flags, called the SEC, they freeze the funds, the, and the, and hacker you know gets a, a uh, gets a lawyer they go before the court and the judge decrees stealing and trading or hacking and trading does not amount to a violation of securities laws the person is not an insider it's not the data they're talking about it's the person not an officer of a company not an agent of the company not an attorney for the company he's an outsider you can trade on insider data provided you are not an insider they release the cash <laughs> Open season, right? <laughs> this happened. You know, we could speculate all we want. This is what the this is what the judge said. How long did it take for the SEC to It was weeks. Now there's precedence. So <laughs> So now, the next step, uh, the Times, because no one really had, had, had to go further, the Times speculates the Department of Justice has simply deemed the case not worth pursuing, probably due to the difficulties involved in gaining cooperation from the local authorities to capture criminals in the Ukraine. He's gone, 300, 300 cash for a night's work, worth of work, done. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's this story. At least that's not what I read in that particular story. So that might have been the case, but this person hacked in. The way I understood it is he hacked in, landed Trojan code or whatever, got data, pulled it out, traded. So, all right. So now we have pump and dumps. 
and we have the reverse. We have what we like to call poop and scoop. <laughs> so, on now this is fairly recent. Like this is a, a 2008 story. So on Sunday night, on a on a Sunday night, a 2000 news story about United Airlines. So person goes to a, a the Sun. I'm sorry, the Sun Sentinel website, South Florida newspaper, and starts they start seeing traffic for a 2002 story about United Airlines filing for bankruptcy. They start flooding the sites Sunday night, okay? Now that, you know, we see a lot of sites, what's the most read story on this particular newspaper? And all of a sudden it gets featured, right? On Sunday night, there's not a whole lot of traffic. So this story gets featured. It gets a brand new URL and gets indexed on Google, <laughs> right? So it gets indexed on Google, shows up on Google News. Somebody from, on um, working on behalf of Bloomberg, does a Google search one on, on Monday morning looking for uh, bankruptcies. Up pops this brand new news story from Sun Sentinel Times that says, from 2002, that says uh, United Airlines filed for bankruptcy. Given the nature of the environment, they take it for what it's worth that it's a brand new story. They forget the date and they transpose it onto Bloomberg News Service as a late breaking story. Stock tanks goes from $12 to $3 before they, they for trading and suspended. Shares return to a normal levels. Uh, you know, in the weeks that follow. Now, I can safely say this is completely, completely legal. All the person did was hit reload over and over and over again on a little tiny newspaper in South Florida. <laughs> How non-technical do you need to be? <laughs> All right, so we, ma we made it through. Is there any questions before I go? <laughs> I'm saying I don't know, actually. Do you have any information about what that person is Nope. No one ever investigated. What's, why, why investigate? There's no, absolutely no reason to investigate. There's no law broken. <laughs> so. That might be, but this... This person is just reloading a web page. You might be right. You might be right. I, I do know that Google News and uh, the Google Trend stuff is routinely gamed in this way. Very similar ways. You, you ship out, you CSRF a whole lot of people to search for a particular term, and it does spike on Google Trends and different things. Now, now those situations are slightly different in that there you have part of, you know, Google had the ability to reverse control. They choose not to for business reasons. I can see why public policy would say, why should the law enforcement spend money to protect us? <laughs> So these things are out there. You can take your and people can and do take their chances. I'm sure. I mean, of the things that you can do online to make money, that's probably one of the ones that they're not likely to go after. <laughs> At least I haven't seen them do it. So business logic flaws. If you haven't figured it out, they make a lot of money. Prime target for the bad guys. The way to defend against them, best we can tell, is to test often, test everywhere, because not all vulnerabilities can be identified in by analyzing the code in the design phase. Some only show up in production, maybe not even QA. So these things are everywhere, multi-site, multi-dimensional. Sometimes it just takes a clever person to figure it out. Um, you can, we think we can start detecting attacks by profiling, since a bad actor on the website does tend to stick out over the norm on everybody else out there. So I am tracking companies that have, t have technology solutions for this stuff. It's not us, but other people. Because um, all the, the attacks, uh, the traffic does look legitimate. It looks like everything else. None of the things that we did here have any shell meta characters or script tags in the URL because we don't need them. So what did we learn? Because uh, we're running a little bit over time here. So solving CAPTCHAs, it gets you four figures. Manipulating online payment systems, that'll give you five. Uh, high five figures for hacking banks. You can scam e-commerce and make six. You can exploit uh, affiliate networks for a high six. Uh, you can game the stock market for seven, you know, but if you can pwn arsenic in a chihuahua contest, now that's priceless. <laughs> uh, any other questions to follow up? Okay. Don't th do anything I, I wouldn't do or would, whatever the case may be. <laughs> anyway, um, again, thank you all for coming. You can, uh, we can ask questions after if you like.